till I had an African classmate in college that. Well, we'll give everyone just another minute or two. It seems like most people are here. Hey, sorry. Um, but Jason, we can't hear you very oh. well. How about now? Keep talking. Uh, here, I'll go on mute for a second here. Well, let's just go ahead and get this party started. I know that most of us, or at least maybe half of us, were on that call already with um, that STIP training. So I think we've already, <laughs> we probably had a quorum then. Uh, it looks like we do have a quorum though. So uh, I think our next step would be to approve the agenda for, for today. May I ask for an agenda adjustment? Okay. Um, could we move my presentation before the CDOT update? I have another meeting I have to go to. Wendy, that is that okay? For us. Okay. Thank you, CDOT. Yep, it's good. No problem. Uh, this is Brian. I'll move approval of the agenda with that adjustment. And this is Brandy. I'll second. And one thing you need to do, Dole, is let Jessica go through and take attendance. Oh yeah, it says that. Jessica, you want to take attendance real quick? Sounds good. I'll go ahead and uh, run down our list of members. And um, if you'll just let me know when I finish, if I missed you or not, and then that way I can mark you as present. Uh, give me one sec to catch up here. Um, I have two phone numbers on the line. I just want to double check who those are real quick. Um, 390-1909. It's Rick Arpin from Fort Carson. I thought so. Rick, Perfect. And then other phone number we have on the line is 687-8812. Fred Clifford with Teller County. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So with that, I'm running down the list. I can see Kathleen, Wendy. Um, Colorado Springs, I see Tim, Gail, uh, Brian, Craig, El Paso County, we have Victoria, Jennifer. Um, I can see Aaron is here from FHWA. Brandy, uh, Dole from Manitou. Um, new, rep or new member from Peterson. I'm, I'm really sorry if I mess up your name, please correct me. Ioka, Ioka. Um, Darren for Shriver, Jason for Palmer Lake. Um, Amy Kelly, Sally Riley, who all joined um, that I've missed? Angie from Green Mountain Falls. Perfect, I was looking for you. All right, anybody else? Hi, this is Kristen from Federal Transit, FTA. Perfect, I will get you uh, noted in here. Thank you. Kristen. Um, okay, all right, with that, uh, I just ask that you state your name when making a motion. That way we record it in the video and it's easy to go back for minutes. Um, other than that, I turn it back to you, Chair. Thank you. So to <clears throat> go back in time, I think Brian made the motion to approve the agenda and Brandy seconded it. You are correct. Now you have to ask for them to vote. Okay, all those in favor, say aye or show aye. of hands. Aye. Anyone opposed? Say nay. Or leave your screen muted. <laughs> it's hard when not, not everyone's on video. Okay, are there any other public comments of anything that needs to be brought up that isn't on the agenda? Okay. Um, I hope everyone had a chance to review the meeting minutes from the December, from those several meetings we had, because there were quite a few at a time. So we need to I, I, we need a motion to approve the minutes of all those meetings. Can I just ask a quick clarification? Because I thought we did that in our January meeting to get that off the list. 
Correct. The only ones that you need to approve was February 1st and uh, the last meeting January. We already went over the two December ones. That was a typo. So okay. just February and then the regular meeting in January. So yeah, Dolls, you, I think you missed that or something in there. So yeah, we did all the rest of those. So you okay, so we just need the January 11th and February 1st meeting. Just need those minutes approved. Right, we just need our last TAC meeting and then the, the last special meeting. The one that Sally earned a gallon of coffee on. <laughs> exactly. So with that, I'll move to for approval of the January 11th 2021 special meeting and the February 1st, 2021 special meeting. Do we have a second? I'm gonna interject because I'm confused and since I'm not the chair, I don't get to go over the agenda anymore, but Dole, if you want me to do that for a while, I don't mind volunteering. Shouldn't we have minutes from the January 21st meeting, our last official TAC meeting? They're in the packet, yeah. Andy. Right, but they're not on the um, motion. Like they're not oh. on approval of minutes. January 21st. Right, so what, were you, what we really should be approving if you want to amend your motion is January 21st and February 1st. January 21st yeah. isn't listed and we already voted on January 11th minutes. Okay, now I'll Good amend catch. the motion. Yes, great catch. It's January 21st. 2021 and February. This is Brian, I'll second. Apologies for that typo. We'll make sure it's cleaned up on that agenda as well. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, motion passes to approve the agenda. And then John, do you wanna do the director's report? Uh, yeah, so on the director's report, uh, at the last board of directors meeting, we had a, a, a presentation from Senator Carter's office, Annie Oakman Gardner. Uh, so we touched on transportation a little bit there. Um, the only other things that had to do with transportation, if we, let's see, we had the membership appointments. Uh, so Angie with uh, Green Mountain Falls was appointed there. Um, Fred, uh, I don't think you've uh, sent something to the board yet uh, to get to, uh, uh, an official membership. So uh, you might want to put that on your radar screen. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, then when we hit uh, action items, um, we did tip amendment number eight and tip amendment number nine. Uh, we talked about the stimulus funds. Um, at that uh, time, um, the board went ahead and approved um, just upping the allocation for Green Mountain Falls slash Tiller County um, and again, using round numbers, I think went from uh, 70,000 to 92,000. Uh, then the uh, board also approved the uh, target, the traffic safety targets and the uh, pavement uh, targets. So that's what, the, what was handled at the board meeting um, on the February 10th. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments for John? Okay, Catherine, looks like you get to lead us into our next action steps there. Which one are we doing? Stimulus fund requirements. Okay, there we go. All right, so John, do you want me to take this one or did, since you had previously, I'm happy to since, why okay, not? Why don't you go ahead and take it since, I, like I said, I think at this point we're all pretty much on the same page and it's getting into the, uh, um, nuts and bolts of it that uh, you're working with uh, Lachelle and Wendy on. So uh, it'd probably be better for you to do it because uh, I think you know more about it at this point than I do. Okay, I just wanna make sure. <laughs> All right, so this, as John mentioned, we have been talking about this for a few months now um, over our multiple meetings. So the board did approve the allocations that you all recommended to them. Um, on Wednesday for 200 each for the seven members listed in the tip and then the remainder of that 92,491, which includes that extra amount that we um, mentioned before uh, for the Teller County and Green Mountain Falls split. And, um, and they um, said that they would like TAC to recommend how to split that as determined by need. So 
um, we can you can work through that later once we decide or once we figure out um, the needs of Teller County, the needs and the eligibility, I should say, of Teller County and Green Mountain Falls. Um, so with that, we wanted to bring to you this potential action item. It, you don't have to take any action if everyone is able to agree um, with these CDOT requirements for relief fund payments. And so we wanted to bring that to you. Uh, as outlined by CDOT, we are still waiting Federal Highway uh, final guidance on how this will be handled. But in general, we, are, we recommend following the CDOT requirements, which essentially follow the Federal Highway requirements um, as they stand for current projects. So those requirements are um, the allocation of this pool. We would put it into the tip and the stip as a, as a pool. And then that project description would describe how much each entity or jurisdiction would be allowed to request for reimbursement. Um, then we would ask that each of you would submit a application. It would be a short one, just asking kind of outlining um, what you're requesting, what activities you plan to ask reimbursement for, and that you agree to these requirements. Uh, and then that approval would need to go through CDOT um, for, for formal approval and then an IGA or an MOU, they're still working out whether or not it needs to be a formal IGA. Uh, and then once that is signed and approved by CDOT, then you may begin work and documentation for transportation maintenance and operation expenses um, as outlined by Federal Highway. So you cannot get reimbursed for any funds that have been spent already or that are spent prior to having this signed agreement with CDOT. Once you do, then you'll start documentation um, and then ask for reimbursement payments or one big payment, depending on how you handle, how um, your finances work. And we ask that, and CDOT asks that these funds be obligated by the end of calendar year 2021 um, and early 2022 at the latest, realizing that some of these could take a little bit longer, depending on how much money you uh, how long it takes you to spend the reimbursement. Um, again, these are provided by CDOT and we're still waiting possible more guidance from Federal Highway. So no action needs to be taken unless you guys can't agree to these and then need, we need to reallocate or re-recommend allocations of the funds. Catherine, <clears throat> this question may be for Wendy and, and um, uh, someone else from CDOT, but I know right now, I know for a fact that CDOT's having a hard time getting their IGAs done in a, an efficient time just because of pandemic and other things. Is CDOT, it would be helpful to maybe lay out the schedule for this because I mean, that's like a six, seven, eight month process in just those seven bullet points or seven bullet points, you know? And, and then the second part of that question would be is I'd wonder if that process is any different if they're using those funds to amend current projects. So if you're adding funds to a project you already have in the tip and the stip, then the IGA for those um, projects needs to be amended as well. It's not as lengthy as of a uh, process as taking the funding from ground zero and moving it forward. Um, we have I was told on a meeting that uh, we had regarding these funds and, and this process that there's three new um, contract writers that have recently been hired. So I don't know that our lag time is going to continue to be an issue. It's just a lot. It's just a lot for CDOT to have to handle now all of a sudden. You know, this is times the whole state, you know. Nobody else is doing this but you. But he this is the ACG. This unique to us to, to oh. just be PACG. Okay. They can they can do it, but we are the only ones that are actually doing it in the in the state. So. Okay, well that's good then. Yeah. So yes, there that is one of the concerns I kind of brought up regarding the, the deadline by the end of the year was that you know if we have to have this formal agreement signed, it could take a while before you even can start spending or asking for reimbursement. So, and I and CDOT understands that. So they're gonna, and like Wendy said, they've hired some additional contract writers. So we hope the process will move 
rather quickly once I just think as long as everybody understands that it's going to take quite a bit of time you know yeah okay so does anyone want to have any action on this or are we continue to be okay with this allocation I just have a quick question. We got that letter kind of um, yesterday afternoon from CDOT. Does that match what these are, Catherine? Or, I mean, I know the agenda had to come out before we got that letter. Uh, yes, we actually had that letter a little bit earlier than you all just, we wanted to make sure we were okay with the wording and we did some back and forth with them just to clarify. So it does incorporate um, that letter. The only things I would, um, mention a little bit more about that letter if you haven't had a chance to read it is that um, if you add these your stimulus funds to a project which um, El Paso County and um, sorry my brain <laughs> Colorado Springs the two of them uh, added money to their projects but then also some of you swapped the STP Metro for SDBG stimulus funds um, those projects CDOT would like to track them. And I think we've mentioned this to you before is that they'd like to make sure that those funds get spent within this calendar year. And they wanna make sure that they are being transparent to the public about how and when those funds for the stimulus dollars are being spent. So just a, a note on that, that they, would, they will be asking you for status updates on those projects. Well, and Brandy, to your point, I mean, that one sentence that says, you know, because it basically goes through a bunch of stuff that isn't critical to the requirements and that, that almost that last paragraph, it says, you know, one unique feature of these federal funds is that they are eligible for operations and maintenance expenses that Title 23 dollars do not generally include. So then you have to go and figure out what Title 23 dollars, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't, it would be nice to have a bulleted checklist or bulleted points or of eligible expenses, you know. And at this point, I, John, correct me if I'm wrong, or Aaron, um, we don't really have that bulleted point. We have something that says, you know, maintenance and oper operations for transportation expenses, but more detail on that, I'm not sure we have. Hi, uh, this is Aaron Busto with Federal Highways. So you are correct that we don't have a coverall definition of each thing, but if you look at the language, it does say it's STBG eligible. So it's all of those eligibilities. Uh, and we do have federally defined terms for maintenance and operations and stuff. The salary one, we don't really have. So that might be the only questionable one, but everything else, there is some level of understanding of what it is. But yeah, you, we haven't provided um, like a worksheet or, or <clears throat> excuse me, a checklist that has all that information. All right, then maybe adding in with the application form, the, the definitions of maintenance operations. Um, we can get a so little more clear. I'm gonna, if I could translate this agenda item, just so it makes at least a little bit more sense to me. Basically, you're asking everybody, this is your last chance to say no. So if you want to give your money back, speak now or forever hold your peace, because these are the rules that you're going to have to follow. And as long as everybody's willing to go forth and follow the rules, we don't need to do anything. Right, Catherine? Correct. Exactly. Okay. So I, I mean, I personally don't think we need to do anything with this. If anybody else thinks differently, by all means, chime in. I'm with Brandy. This is Victoria. This is Angie and GMF. Thank you for the money. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, I think we're good to go on that, Catherine. Okay, great. Glad to hear it. Um, you'll be hearing more about the application hopefully soon. So, um, oh, that, I guess that was the other part of this conversation. John um, mentioned that we can move forward with this process now with these CDOT guidance and requirements that pretty much follows what we think Federal Highway will be okay with, but we don't know, you know, 100% that this is um, the process that will be okayed by Federal Highway. So we either can hold off um, on starting this application process and moving forward, trying to get the IGAs, or um, we can hold off or keep or continue on. 
So we wanted to kind of get your feelings on that situation as well. And So I have a question, do we need any additional guidance from FHWA to do that or should we just start the process? That's what we don't know for sure is if we get any more guidance, if it's actually going to change anything. It may or may not. We could always change course midstream, right? I mean, isn't, isn't it advantageous for us to start and then if something changes, we kind of change course? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the Federal Highway is going to have an issue with us, you know, having a full application process because that's what we do anyways, or signing, uh, you know, formal contracts with con CDOT so that you can get the funding. Um, again, that's something we already do. I, the, the big change or a small change might be um, eligibilities. Does that sound accurate, John? Yeah, I, I think that at the end of the day, we have a pretty good idea of what's going forward. So um, and I think, if, and we have a, an established process that if we sort of follow, uh, we should be fine. The, the only caveat to this, and this is why we just want to make sure everybody knows is as we go down this road, if there is something um, in the guidance when we finally get it, um, we just want to make sure that everyone understands that that could change course like, um, uh, Tim is saying. So if everyone's fine with that, I think we can continue down the road of putting together an application, getting the application out to you guys, starting that process, and, and then hopefully by then we'll, um, we'll get some sort of um, clarification or additional guidance. At this point, I think, I, again, we're pretty much following the standard rules. So I, I think we're pretty safe. The only weird, weird thing is, I think Aaron mentioned it before is, how to do the sal the you know the salaries and some maintenance and operations stuff, um, and, and depending on that, and uh, kind of an off the wall example, um, I think uh, Fred Teller County has said, well, uh, the the project that you want to do is um, um, some sort of dirt road. Typically, those aren't, and when you read the uh, guidance right now, that might exclude that. So. Uh, there might be, you know, I think you, you, you might find that there, there aren't as many eligible activities for you by the time we get the guidance. That being said, there may be. So um, I, I have a feeling that any sort of um, tweak like that is going to really sort of more impact Green Mountain Falls slash Teller County and how we split that 92 between the two of them versus how it's going to impact any of the rest of you. Certainly Colorado Springs and um, El Paso County are, are good because they rolled it into an existing project. Um, and I think the rest of you are all going to be doing uh, maintenance and operations activities within the urbanized area on functionally classified roads. So you're probably not gonna have an issue and there's very little risk moving forward, but there is risk and we wouldn't be doing our, our jobs if we didn't point that out, so. But John, there's also probably several checks and balances. I mean, PPACG staff will review it. CDOT will review it. I mean, you know, we, we wouldn't obligate funds. I don't think that weren't even, you know, like the example you just gave probably would not happen because it would have been flagged at multiple steps before the IGA is signed. You're absolutely right, Dole. But again, uh, we could certainly spend a couple of months working on something and then have something come up. And that's all yeah. we have to make sure is everybody was aware that the, we're as sure as we can be and we can work towards it. Uh, but the, the guidance comes out and says something different. We can't just say, oh, but we've already started. And that's not going to cut it. We're going to have to do whatever the guidance says. That, that's the only point we wanted to bring up. Well then, well, then forgive the pun, but we should just stay in the lane we've been in all this time. Yep. <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay. Well, then it sounds like we're going to move on. All right, so this is for a tip amendment number 10 for FY21 through 24 tip. We have requests from CDOT to update two projects and then, um, then add projects, the stimulus relief fund pool as well. So the first one is from CDOT for US 24 West Woodland Park to divide. It's to update the project costs and the fiscal year per CDOT request. Um, 
the project is being advanced and that's why they're at changing it. And then the second one is for the Bill Grant MAMSIP I-25 corridor and the South Academy Bridge. They're just making adjustments to the funds based on um, new updated allocations for that project. Um, it's still fully funded and good to go. Uh, and then finally, we have the PPACG stimulus fund relief pool for that 1,092,491 and the allocations are listed below the table there. And so I'm asking for a recommended rent recommendation for the board of directors approval. Victoria, move approval. This is Jennifer, second. All those in with that, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. This will be great for our area. I have a question before we move on. How will I know? This is Wendy. How will I know what to do with the ninety-two thousand dollars? Am I splitting it evenly? That I'm hoping Teller County and Green Mountain Falls have uh, been having conversations about that. We. Uh, and if not, we can get with them and see what we can, uh, if we split it evenly, if they could both use that amount of funds or if maybe Teller County can't use quite as much, um, Angry Mountain Falls can, um, we can leave it as is now and then do a, a modification to that project uh, or for that de description, I guess, to split it. Um, what do you yeah, think I is best? Think well, I'll just, I'll go through and I'll enter everyone else except for that last 92,000. And as soon as you have some idea of how it needs to happen, then I'll enter that so we only have to do it once, okay? Thank you, Wendy. This is Andy. No problem. Happy to reach out to Teller County and, and get that talk started. And Angie, you took the words out of my mouth. We can certainly talk because I do think that with our maintenance activities on the dirt road, that our allocation may be much less. So uh, we'll, we'll touch base here in a day or two, if that's okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Please let us know if you need us to um, start those conversations or hold the meetings for you or whatever you need from PPACG. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments on that? I think that's good, Catherine. And then Victoria, you asked to go next on just some of our informational updates. Yes, please. Can I just hit share screen and will that work, Jessica? Uh, yes, give me one sec to turn off this uh, agenda share and then it should work for you. All right, go ahead and give it a try. Can you see that? Yes. Very good, all right. So we are doing a local road safety plan. We got some federal dollars to help us do this. Um, we're trying to understand the contributing factors to crashes throughout El Paso County focusing on the unincorporated areas. We're gonna be looking at behaviors, roadway characteristics, types of crashes, external factors, the whole five E's system. We're gonna, we've been locating crashes um, and trying to put them into GIS, which has sadly been far harder than one would think. Um, and we are determining where on the road system the crashes are being overrepresented based on ADTs um, and, and vehicle miles traveled. We're gonna identify and recommend some effective solutions to address the particular kinds of crashes that we have here in the county and provide specific suggestions to improve safety. And we have a timeline and goals for implementation and evaluation in the plan. So this is basically the federal um, local road safety planning process where you establish a leadership who Jennifer is our safety champion. Thank you, Jennifer. You analyze the data, determine our emphasis areas based on what the crashes say, identify strategies to address those emphasis areas and try and reduce those crashes, 
prioritize and incorporate strategies and evaluate and update your plan. So we'll, we're gonna be following that federal process. We hope that this is gonna be comprehensive, data-driven. It's gonna be network-wide in un unincorporated El Paso County. We're looking at a multidisciplinary approach. So whether it's enforcement, education, or changes to roadways or, or maintenance practices, and we're trying to be really proactive in this process and address things before they get to be too bad. So this is our planning approach. Again, it's just that basic federal highways process and we have stakeholder and public engagement throughout the whole process. I'm gonna show you that here in a second. We are hoping to have us this plan done by the end of this year. So we've had our first stakeholder meeting. Um, we're planning our second one in, June, in April and we should have some of the data analysis finalized by then so we really have a good sense of what we're looking at. This is our draft vision and mission. So we wanna have safer El Paso County roads for everyone. And our mission would be to reflect our community values by working towards zero transportation deaths and reducing serious injuries and through improved infrastructure and driving behavior, utilizing the five E's, education, encouragement, engineering, enforcement and evaluation. So this is our website, it's epcsaferroads.com, and we do have um, an email address so that you can provide any comments you'd like through, through the email system. And we have some road facts, and I'm just gonna kind of shift forward here. This is um, where we're gathering some public input right now, and I'm gonna switch over to our actual website so that I can show you what we're looking at. So this is basically all our roads. When you zoom in, you can see the roads get a little bit easier to see Vic and read. Victoria, you'll have to change your share screen to that new, the actual web browser. Did we it not can, We only see the PDF. No, really, it didn't switch over? Yeah, no, stop sharing and then start sharing. Yeah, again. you got to reshare that new, either share oh. the whole screen or just the window. Oh, geez, Siri, you know what? I'm just going to skip it. You guys can figure out how to do it. I'll show you how. <laughs> As you can see, the colored dots, um, we've already gotten about 150 comments from the public. And um, we've also gotten about 30 emails from various people who either didn't want to use the system or thought it was just easier to email, which we're perfectly happy with. Can you see my cursor right here over this dot? Yes. Okay, so you click on that button and it gives you all the different colored dots and they all list out various kinds of safety concerns. So there's, you know, visual hazards. You can't see around the curve. There's speeding, there's running stoplights, there's no shoulders, there's poor pedestrian access. There's a whole bunch. There's probably 30 different safety concerns. And so you click that button, you select your concern and then you locate it on this map, which you can zoom into, which I can't do for you right now because I'm trying to get to another meeting. <laughs> um, but we've gotten some really great comments so far. And when we do get comments that are gonna be in some of your incorporated areas, we're gonna package those up and ship them off to you guys so that you have the same information um, about concerns in your areas that we're getting in unincorporated El Paso County. So please feel free to, you know, get onto our website, share it with whoever you like. If you've got stakeholder groups like Tim C uh, your it's CTAB, is it CTAB? I think it's CTAB. Um, but your your uh, citizen transportation group, anyone you want to share this with, please have them uh, go on there because we're not only looking at where crashes are happening in the past, we're we really want to know where people's concerns are so that we can prevent those issues in the future. And that's all I have, unless y'all have any questions. Uh, real quick, Victoria, have you, have you guys been coordinating some of this with CDOT as well? We have the grant through CDOT and we got a bunch of the crash data from CDOT and I do have um, a bunch of CDOT people on our stakeholder okay. group, so Great. yes. Because I see Highway 94 and 24 have all kinds of red dots. So looks like you do have their data. <laughs> yep. Uh, Victoria, this is uh, John. I, when you mentioned before the uh, uh, kind of geocoding the uh, the accident data, uh, did you guys do that through a 405C grant? 
Now we're paying for part of it through this local road safety plan, but we actually had to do a supplemental contract to do some additional data gathering and we're paying for that out of road and bridge. Oh, okay. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of comment to everybody that the, the 405C grant uh, process that helps with the geocoding of data. I know Colorado Springs got um, 405C grant uh, last year and is working towards that. Uh, uh, Tim, I, I don't know if that's part of your wheelhouse or not. Um, and additionally, I know that uh, Jason O'Brien with PKCG uh, has got a 405C grant um, for this upcoming cycle. Um, and we're trying to pick up a lot of the uh, information data gaps uh, that we don't have um, uh, from what El Paso County is doing and from what Colorado Springs is doing. So hopefully between the three different efforts, uh, we'll have a pretty good idea of, of where we need to go. So if you're concerned about that, um, just check with us and make sure that uh, um, we don't already have you covered within one of those other ones before anyone goes and starts spending money on anything new. So. Yeah, we've been coordinating with Jason and Tim. We've been coordinating with Molly out in your shop um, and we've been gathering their data, anything that they have, we were able to exclude from ours um, and some of those other jurisdictions, we were able to just kind of pull them out because it happened in the city of Fountain or something like that. Um, but we are gonna be sharing our data with PPACG when we're done so that you guys can locate the remaining crashes that that our two efforts have not done. Perfect, thank you so much. You're we'll welcome. Pick that up. So Victoria, will you be sharing your presentation with everybody? Oh, if you'd like, sure. Yeah, I, I think um, I'd like to share it with Todd. He, he's actually developing a safety program for implementation this year for us also, so. Actually, Todd saw the bigger one, I believe. He's on my stakeholder group. Okay, good. But I will happily share this with, uh, in fact, Catherine, I think you already have it. Please feel free to send it out to the whole tech. Yeah, we, we can share it. I think uh, Jess Bechtel's got the distribution list. You can just send it out to everybody. Great. Well, thanks for listening to me chat. Thanks, Victoria. I'm going to try and stop sharing. Okay, CDOT updates. Wendy, is that you? Uh, this is Kathleen. Wendy, do you have any reports for Region 2? I do not. OK. Well, I'll start with, uh, this is Kathleen Collins from C.HQ Statewide Planning. And um, I have a couple staff updates. The first one is that David Kretzinger, the Division of Transit and Rail, uh, director, he is leaving CDOT to work for the city and county of Denver. Um, that was uh, noted at the Transportation Commission meeting today. And I just wanted to let you know that. And then we also have Teresa Takushi here, um, who's attending. And I wanted to let you know that directly after this meeting, I believe there is a Region 2 meeting uh, related to transportation policy and rulemaking uh, for greenhouse gases. It's a working group and we hope uh, folks who are interested can attend that meeting. And Teresa, I know you're here. I was wondering if you have anything to add to that announcement. Yeah, um, I did share some slides. I'm not sure if this is the right time, um, Chair and members, but um, it's, it's basically the slide deck that I'll be giving to the region to um, re stakeholders at three o'clock, but thank you. Um, thanks to John and the planning team for just having me on the agenda. I am the, so I'm Teresa Takushi. I'm the Greenhouse Gas Climate Action Specialist at CDOT. And we're just doing a lot of outreach right now to let people know about this greenhouse gas rule and policy and really just hear feedback. We're really in the initial stages. So, um, I'm not sure, again, if this is the right time or if you just want to share those slides um, with your uh, members, but looking forward to feedback and I'm excited to hear um, what everyone has to say about as we move forward with this rule and policy. So thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Um, another announcement that was made by John Cater at the 
the uh, Transportation Commission was that the two Colorado scenic byways are now designated as national scenic byways. One is Highway of Legends in the Region 2 area from Walsenburg to Trinidad, uh, west of I-25 along portions of US-160, State Highway 12, and State Highway 46. Um, another one that's in region portions of Region 3 and 5 is Silver Thread, and that extends from South Fork, just uh, south of uh, Gunnison to Blue Mountain, uh, Blue Mountain Mesa Reservoir. And um, so that's exciting news. And then I noticed that uh, Jessica sent out a notice of funding availability for infra grants. Um, they're due on March 19th and uh, approximately $889 million is available. And the intent of that program is to create good paying jobs, boost the economy, ensure equity and uh, tackling climate crisis. Those, so that, that program was announced. And those are my only updates. And uh, thanks to Teresa for chiming in and, and adding more information on the greenhouse gas uh, transportation policy and rulemaking. Yeah, and just, just uh, real quickly, Dole, uh, there is an item on the agenda for Teresa to go through the yep. uh, we were, slides. We were gonna give her back the floor. Good, I just wanted to make sure we, <laughs> she didn't leave. <laughs> So, but I think actually Craig is first and then, then Teresa, if I remember the agenda correctly. I'll be quiet now. Well, Craig, are you okay waiting for a minute? We had just told Teresa that she might as well go since they were talking. Craig, do you have enough time to hang around for a few minutes? Yeah, that, that'd be fine, Cole. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, do you want to share a screen or do you want me to? Is there a preference? Teresa, go ahead. That way you can work okay. through the material and pace. Let's see if I can get there real fast. Hang on. Sorry, bear with me for just a moment. Okay. Can you see those now? Almost. There we go. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we are in the initial phases of doing outreach and um, stakeholder engagement. Um, so th this slide deck is just talking about incorporating greenhouse gas emissions reductions into transportation planning. I'll go it through it quickly. If you're interested, um, in attending the meeting at um, three o'clock, please join us. Um, that is the Region 2 specific one and I'll get to those um, dates if you want. And so um, basically this is, uh, I'm gonna give a quick overview of the Colorado's climate legislation and the policy framework that outlines um, what, where this came from. I'll talk about the proposed rules and policy for the transportation sector and then talk about um, our stakeholder input process. So, Colorado has um, many efforts to address climate change. And the first one is through House Bill 1261. So in that bill that was passed in 2019, that established these greenhouse gas reductions targets um, of 26% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2025, a 50% reduction by 2030, and 90% by 2050. And those are all from 2005 baseline, baseline levels. So that's for all sectors of, um, in Colorado. And the roadmap really lays out the near and long-term actions in each sector in order to meet those established targets. So the roadmap was um, recently finalized, actually in January, and it's on the Colorado Energy Office's webpage. So if you're interested in more specifics about that, you can find it there. But um, basically, it's, it discusses how to reach those targets while also reducing local air pollution and realizing the full economic benefits of transitioning to the clean energy economy. So this lays out kind of what the emission sources are currently. So uh, this is information that's taken from the greenhouse gas roadmap process and their modeling um, that occurred. So as I mentioned, 2005 is that baseline year. So back in 2005, electric power was actually the largest sector of greenhouse gas emissions in Colorado with transportation being the second largest um, followed by oil and gas and buildings. Since then, um, transportation is now the largest um, source greenhouse gas emissions. And that has to do with um, 
power plant, you know, power plants that have shut down, power plants that have converted, and renewable um, renewables that have come online. And when you look at 2020, based on projections from the model, um, it looks like transportation is still the number one source of emissions looking at even into 2020. So that's why it's super important for us to kind of take a look at this right now at, at this moment. Um, and then the pie chart kind of just shows you a breakdown in all of those different sources. So again, this is taken from the roadmap if you like more detail on all of that. So in order to get to these goals, this, um, this graphic just kind of shows what we need to do in order to get to those levels. And I think focusing on those circles on that red line, that's, those are where we, we need to go. So that's the 26% reduction by 2025, 50% by 2030 and 90% um, by 2050. So you can see that based on what's already happened um, through 2019 actions, we're about halfway there. So we're actually doing great but we definitely have more to do in order to hit those targets. Um, so, sorry, Teresa. Go ahead. Uh, previous slide, you're referencing the COVID impacts, mm -hmm. you know, less, less basically probably mostly transportation related savings, but it's interesting that you're, that those are being carried past the immediate future. So the modeling, um, Yes, the modeling that was done through C3 um, as part of the roadmap process, they had this really unique opportunity where COVID struck right as this was happening and it was the massive just lockdown. And so they actually saw how that impacted um, real time data. And then they were able to kind of think about, okay, if that was just a constant, what would that look like? Um, so I can't, again, I, I didn't do the modeling on this but that's the little bit that I know is trying to convey out that um, decreased um, vehicle miles traveled essentially is what that is. Does that help explain? Yeah, no, no, I just, it's, it's interesting. It's fascinating, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So the roadmap, as I mentioned, has near-term and long-term actions um, in order to address greenhouse gas emissions. And the real, um, the real reason why we're reaching out to stakeholders is for this first item, it's greenhouse gas pollution standards transportation plans. So that's really the focus of our meetings and our stakeholder um, engagement. The reason why um, the red, the trip reduction piece is in here is that that is actually part of a transportation package that's going in front of the Air Quality Control Commission as part of this bundle. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide but it's through a separate process. So I think that that's an important piece to know. So the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission is the body that um, it's appointed by the governor and authorized by the General Assembly. And they are the body that develops air pollution control policy and, reg and regulates sources of pollution. The Air Quality Control Commission is actually taking up a series of rulemakings across all sectors um, to address greenhouse gas emissions. And one of these will be through the transportation sector. Um, the Colorado Department of Transportation and its governor appointed tr transportation commission has statutory authority over the transportation planning process. So this process is guided by a series of policy directives that are issued by the transportation commission. This rulemaking um, will we'll touch on both. And again, I'll talk more about that, but again, just to recognize that there's two different bodies and different sectors that are working on, the, or different agencies that are working on this, but we're collaborating together for this effort. So as I mentioned, there's an Air Quality Control Commission rulemaking, and they are looking at a bundle of transportation greenhouse gas emissions reductions measures. The first of which is integrating greenhouse gas pollution standards and analysis in their regional and statewide transportation plans. So again, the focus of our outreach. Um, and then the Largen trip is another piece of it. They're, they're scheduled to be in a single rulemaking, um, a package to go in front of the commission for a request for hearing in May and a final rulemaking in August. So in parallel to that process, and again, we're working very closely with CDPHE and the Colorado Energy Office, but CDOT in parallel will develop an implementation guidance through a policy directive specific to this greenhouse gas pollution standard. And this is kind of our initial thinking. And again, why we're reaching out to stakeholders so early in this process is we are just seeking feedback at this at this point on our initial idea. And it's this, is to set a numeric greenhouse gas budget for transportation plans. So the idea is that we would start with a state 
um, start with the state level and then really kind of hone in on where are the areas that have the most greenhouse gas emissions. So the most people, the most vehicles, so likely along the front range. And because of the potential significance of this, we really want to do this the right way and move forward thoughtfully. So that's kind of why we're thinking some sort of this phased implementation makes sense in order to do that. And the focus on is on projects that increase capacity. Another way of saying this is that the traditional work of CDOT, you know, the safety of our roads is what we're gonna continue to do. This is really looking at large projects that have a significant greenhouse gas emission um, opportunity. So the guidance, CDOT guidance, will focus on how the practicalities of how to do this, how, how to translate um, specific project-based greenhouse gas emissions reductions, how this translates into reductions that go towards that budget that's set in the rule. And then we're also thinking that we would include other measures in order to meet that budget. And this graphic on the next slide kind of shows what I mean by that. So we have the planning process in step one, which is the statewide plans. And so there's a huge opportunity there and that's kind of where the budget would, would land is on that piece of emissions. But you can see in steps two, three, four, and five, there two is NEPA, three is project design and contracting, four is project construction, and five is operation and maintenance. And you can tell that there are opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in all of those sectors. So once we select projects and they're kind of in the pipeline and moving, there's opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as we go ahead and design and build those projects. So what we're thinking is that those could be potential offsets, again, in order to help us meet that statewide budget. So these are the questions we're just kind of asking and um, just wanted, I mean, I'm not sure how much time today, but this is what we're seeking input from um, is what are, what are your questions and what concerns do you have? What challenges do you see as important to addressing um, as we're addressing this rule and policy and who else should we reach out to? So um, we would love for you guys, um, I know that the meeting this afternoon is, is very quick. So I think we have a pretty good representation of region two. But we also plan to have a future meeting um, in the region. Uh, so these are the regional meetings, as I mentioned. Um, we plan to have another regional meeting in April. So again, we'll reach out to you. Um, I know that we're doing some one-on-one -on -one groups with, with larger groups. Um, so we're really doing broad outreach before we kind of hit pen, you know, do pen to paper and start drafting this Reagan policy. So there's also a CDOT advisory group um, that's meeting frequently about every two weeks in order to guide this. And that is influenced by, um, there's people on that from all across the state, environmental groups uh, and um, disproportionately impacted communities, county commissioners, uh, transportation commissioners. So that's a, a wide variety of stakeholders on that advisory group. There are some listening sessions that you may have heard of that are focused on equity. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on in this space and I appreciate the time today just kind of talk to you about it. Um, here's my contact information if you'd like to contact me if you have um, stakeholders that you think would be interested, um, I would love to hear. So with that, I appreciate the time and I will open it up for questions. Teresa, while people are getting their questions together, uh, I'm assuming the three o'clock meeting is a Zoom meeting or a Google Chats, Google Hangouts. Yeah. Do, do you want to post the link in the group chat? So if anybody would like to copy and paste it, they could hop on at three o'clock if they wanted to. Absolutely, I will. I will do that. Uh, Teresa, at one point there was a discussion of uh, that uh, there may, maybe be a another meeting uh, either next week or the week after, since the this, this meeting today kind of snuck up on us. Um, is that still the plan or not anymore? Um, if it makes sense, John, um, we can touch base. Uh, I think, yes, there was a scheduled meeting. I don't know if it's the same group or a different group, but please let me know. I'm happy to reach out. Yeah, well, and, and again, we don't need to do this now. We'll we'll figure it out. But I think there was an email that got sent to me that then I sent on to uh, Jessica to send out to the board list. So I, I think some of our members of our board may be thinking that that other meeting is, is still um, there. So I apologize if I misunderstood. So. No, no, I think so. What we're trying to do. No, you're absolutely right, John. I We have this meeting. We have um, the regional meeting. We are reaching out, yeah, to, you're, you're absolutely right with those members. Um, and that's, I have, sorry, it's evolving so quickly, but like I said, we're doing a lot of stakeholder outreach to specific boards 
just because we're trying to keep these Zoom meetings pretty small so that we can have candid conversation. Um, so we, we are looking forward to that meeting. Yes, John, thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Teresa? Okay, thank you so much. Interesting. Craig, thanks for waiting. Well, well thank, thank you, Dole, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you guys. Um, I'm Craig Blewett, uh, um, Transit Services Manager with City of Colorado Springs, and in that, in that capacity, I serve as the Director of Mountain Metro Transit. I've uh, been a while since I stopped by your committee. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Can you guys see that? Yes. Awesome. I made it a little bit bigger. So um, we at uh, Mountain Metro Transit uh, conducted a rider survey in, in 2020, and I'd like to share the highlights with you. Uh, we conduct a rider survey every three to four years um, it provides us with useful information on who's riding our buses and uh, gives us insight into important issues and questions as we look to go forward. We, um, we surveyed both our fixed route riders as well as customers who use our door-to-door -door ADA paratransit service. Uh, timing wise, we um, got this survey of the fixed route riders done just in time before the COVID pandemic really hit. Um, we got good data. Um, for the Metro Mobility ADA paratransit side, though, we did not get that done in time. And so um, there were closures and lockdowns already happening. So on that, we just focused on demographic information. Craig, um, I think we, we lost your presentation, maybe when you zoomed in or zoomed out. Uh, okay. Yeah, I I thought it was just Thanks, though. Can you see it now? I can see your menu bar at the bottom, but maybe did you share the wrong screen or something? I, I don't. <laughs> That's entirely possible. Um, hey, Jessica, are you there? Can you rescue me? Yep, I'm there. Go ahead and do a stop share and then reshare it. Or I can pull up the PDF that's in the packet as well. Um, yeah, let me see what I can do here. Don't use Zoom a lot. Well, it was working, and then when you went to zoom in or something, it, uh -huh. it, it seemed to not work after that. Okay. Let's see. Let me help. He's still sharing. There you go. There we um, go. Do you want to try to share it again, or would you like me to pull up your slides? Um, if you would, that would be great. Sure, I can do that. I'm a guy. I'm good at doing one thing at a time. <laughs> So I'm on what says fixed route instruments. So go down two more if you would. Okay. There you go. There we go. Oh, great. Awesome. Thank you so much. So uh, this shows the actual survey that we uh, administered. Um, we had that we had the people fill out. Um, there were both English and Spanish versions. Uh, we had 33 questions, eight um, regarding that day's bus ride, uh, five on general transit use, another five on perceptions and opinions about our services. 14 on demographics and, and one open forum for comment. Next slide, please. Um, so this shows where the survey fell uh, in the momentous <laughs> March 2020. So in yellow, we did the survey between uh, March 8th and 14th. And uh, as, as a state of our, um, emergency was uh, declared in, in, in Colorado, uh, but we did get good data. We got enough uh, random surveys that uh, we can count on the information we got. Uh, next slide. Uh, this shows the uh, the age and gender of our riders. A um, couple points to to uh, to make here. One is the uh, percentage share of, of Gen Z riders, Gen Z riders doubled uh, since the last survey uh, four years ago. And uh, also, we have significantly more men than women riders, um, and that's gotten more pronounced over time. So it's now three to two uh, men to women riders. Next slide, please. Two graphs on this slide. The top one is the employment status. So 70% of our riders are employed full, full or part-time. 17% are students. So 87% are either employed or are preparing to enter their workforce. 
And the bottom graph uh, of those employed, what type of work do they do? So the, the big ones there are leisure and hospitality at 27%, uh, 20% in trade transportation utilities, 13% education and health services, and uh, over 23% in, in other services. So it really is, as we have known, is dominated by people who work in retail and services. And what's key there, these are jobs that are not necessarily eight to five Monday through Friday. They go into evenings and they go into weekends. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this shows household income and household size. Um, fixed route riders uh, tend to be low income. About 80% of our riders are considered to be below the poverty line. Um, at this point, a key role of transit is getting lower income people to jobs and to school. And also make the point that, you know, in transportation, when we talk about vulnerable populations, we generally think of seniors and people with disabilities. And that's true. And transportation is key for those populations. But low income people are also vulnerable. And without transportation, that could push them over the edge. Um, in, the, uh, in the transit world, yeah, the next slide still if you would. Thanks. In the, uh, in the transit world, we're moving away from categorizing transit riders as choice and dependent. And that whole notion that no matter how crappy our service is, that there's certain people who will continue to ride. So it's more useful to consider riders as all purpose, those who use the bus for all kinds of transportation, all kinds of trips, sole purpose, they might just be riding to work or riding to school, and occasional riders who don't ride every day uh, just for certain types. Next slide. Um, first and last mile. So um, how, do, how do people get to the bus? Um, normally from their house. And that last mile, how do they get to their destination from where they get off the bus? Um, first of all, this does not include walking. Walking is to the bus is over 95% of the way the people um, get to the bus and get to their destination off the bus. Uh, but of the, of the other modes, the highest is by bike. And, and we do have um, bike racks on the front of buses. Um, a significant number also get dropped off by somebody. And for Route 33, that's the, uh, the Manitou Incline Shuttle. And a lot of people for that drive and park in the free parking and then get on the shuttle to go to the incline. Next slide. Then we, uh, we asked some questions about riders paying fare, and that's helpful to us as we move to uh, mobile ticketing. And mobile ticketing allows people to buy a bus ticket on their phone and use the phone to board. Uh, this graph shows what type of fare um, they use, whether it's a single ride, 31 day pass, 20 ride ticket, and so forth. And then also if they, um, if they pay regular fare. So a special fare is offered to seniors youth and, and people with disabilities. So again, useful information with mobile ticketing. And next slide. To continue that thought, uh, this graph, graph combines information on whether they have a smartphone and whether they have a data plan with that smartphone and how likely they are to buy a ticket with their phone. And I guess no surprise to anyone, the younger you are, the more likely you are to use your phone to buy, pay for your fare. Um, but a couple of things it tells us is that we need to keep a cash option as we go into mobile ticketing. And our mobile ticketing solution needs to work for people who have a phone, but no data plan. Next slide. This is um, kind of a standard quadrant analysis to show what's important to riders and what things our customers think we do well as strengths and things not so well that we could work on. So from the strength side, we have um, safety on the bus, safety at bus stops, and transfer convenience. And challenges, things that we could do better include uh, frequency and hours of service, the amount of weekend service that we have, reliability of the service, and limitations on, on where buses go. Next slide. This is the same analysis, but we controlled for gender. So key points here is that Women don't feel as safe as men do. Um, and that could well be a reason why we have more men than women riders. And it tells us also that if we can improve safety and the perception of safety for women, we could gain riders. Next slide. 
So um, our Metro Mobility ADA paratransit service, this is, um, um, well, because of the timing of, of the survey, we, we focus more on demographics uh, than on questions about how they felt about their last trip. And um, of our Metro Mobility riders, my, minority are employed, 12% are employed, and 38% are unable to work. So like in like fixed route riders, they, they tend to be low income. A little bit more about Metro Mobility with the next slide. Um, a couple of things about our ADA paratransit service for that. So that's for people who, with disabilities who because of their disability are unable to use our fixed route bus service. And to use the service, people need to make an advanced reservation one to four days before the trip. Um, but for those who go to the same place at least three times a week, you can have an ongoing subscription. And so you don't need to call every time you need to ride for those trips. And so one thing that this um, tells us here is that while 28% of Metro Mobility customers pay online, only 11% make their reservations online. And um, rather they, they do it by telephone. And it would be advantageous if more people did it on, online, they wouldn't have to wait as, as they do sometimes telephone and plus it would be less expensive, expensive to um, administer. Uh, next slide, please. And that's really it, be happy to answer any questions. We do have the link there to be able to get to the uh, full survey results on, on our webpage. Um, it's a really good report. I do welcome people to take a look at it. Um, a lot of good infographics and it's well-written and really um, gets to the point of, of why those numbers are important. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hi, Craig. This is Kristen from FTA. How are you? I'm good, Kristen. How about you? Good. That was a great presentation and a really uh, informative survey. Just one quick question. What, what's the general number of completed responses, would you say? Like a thousand? Um, I think 1000? it was in like the 900 to a thousand range, something like that. I think one of those questions did have a response rate of over a thousand, which is really amazing considering what week it was, right? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's, it's one of those things, I think it's like 95% confident plus or minus 5%. Yeah, great job. Thank you for the update. You're welcome. Any other questions for Craig? <clears throat> thank you, Craig. It's really, there's a lot of data there. There, there is, and thank you. Welcome, folks, to look at the, uh, the full survey on, on, uh, on our webpage. Thanks. Thank you. Catherine, you want to talk about the e-tip system? Sure. So I wasn't going to go into too much detail here. I just wanted to kind of, I know most of you were actually on the training this morning, so thank you so much for attending. Hopefully it was helpful to kind of give you the uh, first go at how to get around that system. Um, so I just wanted to let anyone else know who wasn't able to attend or hasn't had a chance to um, sign up for that, that there's, you can sign up whenever, it's not an issue. Um, and we, they recorded the training this morning um, for anyone who would like to follow along and um, would like to have a chance to see that. So reach out to me if you'd like that recording, we're also probably gonna be sending that out just to everyone just in general um, once they send that to me. So I just wanted to give you the heads up. And if you have any other questions regarding this system, let me know. And that's all. This. Catherine, is that system live now? Is that the system that we're, that's being used? Like it's live? Um, it is, so the system that we have listed on the TIP webpage on our PPACG webpage is still, the one from that we're utilizing from Dr. Cog. So that's the old ETIP system that we're, I guess, calling old. Um, and it's still up there because the public site hasn't been completed yet through this new e tracker or the new tracker system that was training from today. So it is live for you all to use and to down and make reports, um, but it's not um, live as far as the public facing yet. It should be by the end of the month. Okay, and you have the next one as well. All right. So this one is regarding a stip and tip alignment. So you might've heard about this a little while ago, maybe not. Um, 
CDOT has switched to a one year STIP cycle. And so they update this STIP every year and that puts us out of alignment with them, which means um, like for instance, this, uh, this new STIP that they're adopting in May will add year 25, but we don't have year 25 in our document. So they can't add those projects, which causes issues with flexibility for CDOT being able to spend funds um, if they can't reach into year 25 because it's not in the tip. So we need to reconcile this and uh, or we've been asked to reconcile this and we need to uh, for, because we're supposed to be uh, in alignment with the STIP per federal regulations. Uh, so we're proposing a couple of options regarding this alignment. So, and then a couple of other things that we need to do to get into that alignment. So the, there are a couple options. The first one would be to adopt a new tip every year like CDOT does, which would mean a new call every year as well. Um, or I guess it doesn't really have to have a new call, but we can work that out. But anyways, a new tip every year would be adopted, which would mean the full you know, gamut of doing call for projects and um, doing the public outreach and all of that. And then the other option, which we are recommending is adopting a five-year tip every two years. So we would remain on our two-year cycle, but then we would have five years in the tip. Um, this first new one would need to have three years of funding for a call so that we could catch up. And then every um, other year, we would then have to add two years uh, like we already do, but then it would just make it for a five-year tip. And so, and then each intermittent year, we could do roll forwards and make sure that the new current or the most, the current years would be the four that are, that are um, coming up. So I know that gets a little bit messy there. Um, I kind of laid out the sequencing in this uh, document here to give you an idea of how that would work. Um, and another thing, and then the next paragraph it talks about, so we also need to reconcile FY25 so that we can get CDOT's projects in there. After talking with Federal Highway and CDOT, um, they recommend that we, we reconcile this as quickly as possible, which would mean doing a, a full update just to add CDOT projects. We wouldn't need to do a call for local agency projects. We would just do a, a new tip for 22 through 25, which would keep your local projects for 22, 23, and 24. We would add CDOT projects for 25, and then that would be adopted uh, in, I, I believe, regarding my scheduling, I, it was July or August, I believe August. And so then, uh, when we do our full call, we could add years 25, 26, and 27 for the local agencies and CDOT. And then we would make it a 23 through uh, 27 tip. So there's a lot of numbers flying at you. <laughs> and I'm going to do a little bit more of that really quick. Um, so another issue that happens is when we adopt our tip, we have been adopting in about April. This puts, um, causes issue with when they adopt, when CDOT adopts their STIP. So the STIP, they try to have it adopted by May, um, but they get all the projects and everything together in about January and February. And so it has been requested that we actually adopt ours in January instead of April, as we have been doing, which would push our timeline up earlier. And we would need to do our call for projects for that 25, 26, and 27, and moving forward starting in May. So with that, there's a few things I, I wanted to bring up for discussion. You know, if you prefer a one year tip, five year tip, um, and then how you feel about moving up our process to start the call for projects in May and how that might impact your, uh, your budgeting and that sort of thing as far as trying to get projects together for that call. And happy to answer any questions and any other discussions. I know, I'm glad you know what you're talking about, Catherine, because that's fairly complicated. 
It is. <laughs> I know there's a lot of fiscal years flying around. <laughs> Yeah, when do we need to decide by? Um, if we're going to move up our our call for project schedule, I would say we need to do it sooner rather than later so that people know that they need to organize what projects they'd like to request funds for for years 25, 26, and 27. And that would need to happen in May? Yes. Okay. To get that process started. And that would give you two months to apply for the for the funds. So you all have previously asked for about two months to gather those projects. So it wouldn't be a you know a very quick turnaround starting in May. It would just be me sending out that announcement in May. Yeah, I'm okay with May. I don't think that really bothers most of us. I think most of us are on a calendar year. Um, CDOT's the one that's on their own individual year. And I'm probably just going to have Tim and Victoria weigh in because they've got the majority of the projects. Would you rather have a four year or a five year and a one year or a two year? So the people who do this a lot more often than, than we do, I would love to hear your input on the frequency of it. I'll invite myself into the conversation. Thanks, Brandy. Um, I, I prefer um, you know, and I'm good with whatever the consensus is, but I, I would think option two, doing a five-year tip with a call every two years might be um, a lot less work for everybody um, rather than revisiting it every year. That, that's just my thought, thinking out loud. Um, but like I said, if, if the others want to go with option one, I'm, I'm good with that too. Well, uh, I... Glad you piped up, <clears throat> excuse me, glad you piped up, Brian. Um, I don't know if Victoria is online anymore, but you used to manage the PPACG tip. And um, I recall we, we as, a, as the TAC, had suggested going to a two-year tip for the exact reason you mentioned. It was a lot of work every year. And um, it seemed like we would finish a tip and the next thing we know, we're at a call for projects again. So um, historically, you know, we, we've had both options with PPCG, and I think the current setup actually works pretty nice once every two years. Um, that would be my preference is to remain as is. This is Victoria. I am. I'm back actually. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm with you guys both. Um, I'm. At one point, we had a six-year tip, and the problem with it was that we were going too far out that we couldn't estimate costs anymore. So I'm not thrilled with the five with the six-year tip. A five-year tip is not ideal, but it's better than doing it every year. I do not want to go through this every year. The least work for us as possible would be a good thing. Um. To summarize this, would, does anybody is anybody in favor of option one? Because I, I agree. I think having to do a call for projects and spend two months of every year trying to figure through that would be a lot of work. So if you're a fan of option one, please speak up and feel free to share your recommendation. Let me clarify too. It's, it's two month window to fill out, a, fill out an application. And then it's at least two months of an adoption process. Yeah. It's really a four to five month. At least. Yeah. <laughs> we, do that. we have to open it for public comment. And then you have to hear from me month after month saying, here's a draft and another draft. <laughs> yeah. Catherine, it sounds like most people, if not everyone, are in favor of option two. Sounds good. That's what we were recommending. So we're happy to do that. Next time, put in bold staff recommended option. <laughs> don't look elsewhere no. Yeah. <laughs> no we don't we try not to push that on you but yes <laughs> for I think for everyone and see that and every, everyone would be happy with that so um and then any um comments but, or concern with moving the process up so that we can get the adoption in January to give CDOT enough time to get it into their STIP which would mean a kind of a May starting the process in May instead of about um, September, October. Yeah, I think Brandy's, go ahead. 
Sorry, I have no concerns with the timing. So Catherine, if we were to do this this coming May, we would need to do it for fiscal year 25. You would need to do 25, 26, and 27 so that we could then turn it into a five-year tip. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's a, it's a big push. And then the next tip in two years, we would start the process in May and we would only do a call for two years because we would, this year we're just trying to catch up to that five-year. And then from there on, it would only be a call for two years out for the last two years of that tip. So we, sh we should really start thinking about that now. Yes. For sure. Okay. That's why we wanted to make sure it was okay with everyone because I know that really kind of starts the process essentially in your minds now um, to get that moving. Um, yeah, Catherine, do we have um, numbers yet for our region then for those years? We, we can estimate it based on the allocation. I think John said we just got um, FY21 allocations. Is that correct, John? Uh, actually, I think uh, there was a phone call. I, I'm ex expecting that actually there will be a long range plan amendment request coming from Colorado Springs shortly. Um, and so I was on a call the other day with CDOT um, and we were talking about uh, the fact that with that, I would have to update the financial plan. And I asked if they had their, oh, I forget the, what they call it. Uh, out. Program distribution. Thank you. Say, say that again, Wendy, something distribution? Program. program distribution. Program distribution. So and we have program distribution for STP and for TAP because those are prescribed. So those aren't part of the Transportation Commission um, delay. So you, you should, we can have those. Oh, okay. They, uh, they didn't. I don't think they mentioned that yesterday. So yeah. Uh, so, I, I realized that after the fact, and I, I uh, should have okay. said something then. So to answer your question, Victoria, yes, we will have we will have uh, a revised estimates for the five year tip as well as uh, Tim for whenever you guys come and ask for a, a long range plan amendment. Uh, we'll have uh, estimates for that as well. If we could get those as soon as possible so we can start thinking about sort of the magnitude of projects we might be applying for, that would be really awesome. Even if it's not the official call, just an estimate would be great. Kathleen, are you still on the call? She might have left Yes, her. I just took a while to unmute. I'm sorry, I, what's the question? So we need to have the TAP and STP Metro numbers for PPACG. Moving forward, those weren't part of our issue with program distribution. So, how do we go about getting those? I will find out. I I will find out and get back to folks. I may Thank not be you. able to get an answer for right now. Yeah, Victoria. I kind of figured it would take a day or so. Thank you. Okay. Let's hope the gap is done by then. I'm not even going to talk about it. <laughs> but I, but uh, and again, ballpark, just ballparky. Um, as the STP Metro is usually around eight, and I think the tap is around one million. Is that kind of right, Catherine, or did I do too much of the STP Metro? Uh, I think the tap is closer to half a million, but my brain is not. I can't remember I think it's that. About moment, six, maybe six fifty, and and the yeah. STP is around right around eight. Okay. Yeah. So I had the eight right. It was the I was overcompensating for the for the tap. So, all right. If you could just shoot that out in an email because like I've already forgotten what those numbers were. So. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. And John, you mentioned the uh, long range plan amendment. Um, we're, we're ready to move on that. We just need to know what steps to take. Um, okay, and, and uh, I think the email I sent you basically kind of set out those steps, but I'll have um, Mark Northrop, and I think Mark was on the call earlier. I'm not sure if he still is, but I'll have him send you an email with all that stuff. But I think the first step is you basically have to send us a, a letter requesting it, and then we'll send something out to everybody saying, hey, there's a long range plan amendment request 
anybody else have anything because they're they're costly and they take a while. So we want to make sure we do it all at one time. <laughs> um, so as soon as we get that letter from you guys, I think we we can get the process started by letting everybody know. Plus, then I have to um, revise the financial plan and we kind of go from there. Okay. Looking for your email. Okay. Tim, are you going to keep us in suspense or are you going to share? With what? What your long range <laughs> plan amendment may be. We're looking to downgrade US 24 to a collector street. <laughs> no, just you, kidding. Oh my God. <laughs> you, had me say, you had me going there. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's a. Uh, we're looking at um, a project for the Peterson Northgate at US 24. Oh, great, thanks. And I'm sure as long as we're opening the, the Pandora's box of a long range plan amendment, I think uh, CDOT uh, um, Division of Transit and Rail or at least the uh, uh, front range passenger rail folks probably have a few things they'd like us to add. Um, text-wise, not financial-wise, um, for, for the front-range passenger rail uh, to be included in that amendment. And okay. I found your email, John, so thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be rude and sign off and go to that greenhouse gas meeting. I'll see you there, I'll be, I'll, I'm right behind you. Okay, see you, everybody. Thank right. you, Victoria. Okay, Catherine, thank you. Um, do you need an action? I know you have just a discussion there, but do we need to have an action on doing that option number two? I, I don't think we need a formal action. We just okay. needed your, your guidance on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's more and, of a bit nod. It needs to be under action items to take an actual vote. Okay. Okay, Catherine, you're good to go. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else out there have any other announcements or comments they'd like to make before we wrap things up? A quick one. I also have a three o'clock, so I'll have to jump off. Um, I just found out that Val Carr has passed away, um, the mayor of Woodland Park. So I just wanted everybody to be aware of that since he was, he was involved with QPACG. So Sad to hear that. Um, thoughts and prayers to his family and um, definitely to Sally and, and Robin. I'm sure we'll hear more about it in the coming meetings, but thanks for that, Brandy. And um, yeah, Mayor Carr was a huge advocate for the reliever route. Um, and helped us get uh, some funds in 2024 allocated by um, CDOT for a corridor study for the reliever route. So yeah, his legacy will live on. Thank you. Uh, Dole, this is Brian. I just have a, just a couple quick comments. Um, we've just released our spring 2021 service change proposal. Um, we're doing the public meeting uh, virtually. So there's a recorded video with a presentation um, and a survey instrument that's posted on our website. So you can go to our website and view that material and comment. Um, comments will be accepted through next Thursday, the 25th. Uh, basically, there are a couple um, um, system enhancements, uh, one being a new route uh, to the Peak Innovation Park in the Colorado Springs Airport. Um, so Peak Innovation Park is where all of the Amazon activity is, is being constructed. Um, so it's going to be a, a short express route that goes from the Academy Astrazon Superstop to Peak Innovation Park and the Colorado Springs Airport. It's designed, you know, initially this, this first phase, hopefully it will, you know, evolve into a, uh, a second phase. But this, this first phase of service is basically it's designed as a um, employee access route. So it's, it's designed to 
provide service from our existing transfer center to, um, to the Amazon facilities in the Colorado Springs Airport. And it's kind of just designed to serve uh, Amazon's shift changes. So it's, it's not really designed as a, you know, visitors to Colorado Springs can take a service from the airport to get downtown. It's not really um, designed that way yet, but this is a, a first good step to, to provide some service to all of that activity where Amazon is and to the Colorado Springs Airport. Um, the second enhancement is um, Manitou Springs requested uh, Route 36, which is the Manitou Avenue shuttle, uh, be extended further west into town. Um, so instead of it turning around at the Ruxton Avenue roundabout, it will go further west to the Serpentine Drive roundabout. So that opens up that whole western part of Manitou Springs, um, you know, for residents, visitors, um, workers. Uh, they'll now, now have transit service. Um, and, you know, Route 36 is still that seasonal service. It operates from, you know, say late April to late September. But that, that's a good, good plus. Um, Manitou Springs also recommended a few other um, proposals. And one is um, both involving Route 33, which is the incline cog shuttle. Um, during the peak season, we normally operate um, two buses on the weekends to kind of help with the demand of people using it. Um, the city's recommending to eliminate that second bus. So instead of having 10 minute service during that time period from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., um, it'll be 20 minute service. So. Um, that, that's a little bit of a cost saving measure there. Um, and the other proposal for Route 33 is in the off season. So, you know, from January until late April and then late September through December, uh, Route 33 operates until 8 p.m. And actually all year long it operates till 8 p.m. But during those off season times, um, the proposal is to eliminate the last two hours of service and ended at 6 p.m. So those are the are the changes um, being proposed. And like I said, uh, through the uh, end of next Thursday, the 25th, and you know the implementation for those will will be um, you know late April for the 36 and the 33, probably early June for that new Amazon route, and then uh, you know the off season off-season changes to Route 33 will be late September. So thank you all. Thank you, Brian. Does anyone else have any comments they want to share with the group? Bill, if I may ask a question of Lachelle, and Lachelle, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I was hoping you might give us some insight when we would expect our uh, IGAs for the MMOF grants. Hi, Sally, this is Matt with uh, the CDOT Local Agency Unit. Michelle had to step off for another call. Um, do you have a specific project you're requesting or? Yeah, our Woodland Park uh, IGA. Do you know the sub account number for that? No, no, I don't have those memorized, but okay. I'll reach out to you guys offline then. Yeah, yeah Sally, they're, they're ahead, having go. a tough, well, they're, they're having a tough time keeping up with all of the, cause they have to be, but they have to be budgeted separately. So yeah, give Matt a call or an email and he'll help you out. Okay. The MMO has been a slow process all the way around. So uh, yeah. reach out with the sub account number or project specific if you could find it and we could track it down for you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Uh, one last one. Sorry, folks. Um, so uh, it's been 20 years since the city has adopted a comprehensive long range transportation and um, we're in the process of developing one now called Connect COS. And tonight is our first um, citywide public meeting. It's virtual and um, if anybody's interested, uh, it starts at 5.30, you need to register. So if you go to uh, coloradosprings.gov forward slash connect COS, one word, 
Um, you can sign up and participate, watch, join, and uh, see what we got going on. All right. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. I'm not going to ask again. That way we can wrap it up. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, if it, please let Jessica know if there's anything we need, to be, we need to add to the next TAC meeting so we can be prepared accordingly. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, guys. Take care. Stay warm. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>